What you're witnessing is the truth, unfiltered and unashamed. This is the Jason Stapleton Program. The Russians are now saying, uh, get out to Americans. They're ordering U.S. warplanes out of Syria. Why? Because they got their warplanes there now. And they're like, yeah, we're taking over. You guys get out. We're taking over. We're putting our ground troops in, and we don't want you guys mucking stuff up. Uh, and naturally, the U.S. was not at all excited about this. Uh, this says, Russia officials have demanded um, the American warplanes exit Syria. Officials told Fox News that Russian diplomats sent an official demark ordering U.S. planes out of Syria, adding that Russian fighter jets were now flying over Syrian territory. Russian lawmakers formally approved a request from the country's president, Vladimir Putin, to authorize the use of troops in Syria. The Federation Council, the upper house of Russian parliament, discussed, uh, I'm sorry, discussed Putin's request for the authorization behind closed doors. Putin is obligated to request parliamentary approval before sending Russian troops abroad, according to the Russian constitution. So, Russia says, we have a vested interest in this. We're sick and tired of this. As we outlined yesterday, clearly the U.S. has been had a lackluster, to put it mildly, <laughs> Uh, success rate in the area. Uh, some would say they caused the entire mess. And we're going to come in and see if we can't solve it. I believe they already have a base in Syria. I think that the, Putin already has an area in Syria, naval base there, where they can port. Because they have been, uh, I guess, allies with Assad for a long time. And before you go getting crazy, and listen, this is not a Russia is good, America is bad thing. Uh, both of them are involved in a game of international intrigue. Both of them are seeking domination and authority in the region. Both of them are seeking to exert their will in the region. But the, the, the belief is, is that Russia must be bad and we must be right because we're America. We're the good guys. We're the guys in the white hats, and the Russians, well, they're the evil communists. But the Russians look at it, and they say, well, America's the great evil. They're the ones who are out there exerting their will and putting their military in, in places all around the world in the Middle East. They're the ones who are empire building, expanding the empire. And you can't look at that argument and say, well, that's patently absurd. Clearly, there's some truth to it. And so what we have now is Russia is simply saying, America, we think you're weak. We don't think you're doing a good job. We're going to come in here. You leave. Now, the Americans have just flat out said, well, we're not going anywhere. So that brings up a this, really interesting standoff. This has major international incident written all over it. It has. Because you, you've got American planes flying around Syria. You've got Russian planes flying around Syria, all bombing different targets. This just has the potential for there to be a major issue. I, I agree 100%. And the question is going to be, who blinks? Now, if America blinks, what does it say to the world? Remember, we were having the discussion yesterday about kind of how the world is choosing up sides. And if you haven't listened to yesterday's episode, well, man, you are missing out. In fact, you need to go and listen to the last 10 episodes so that you can get caught up to where everyone else is at right now. But what we've got is the world is choosing up sides. Now, what does it say if America says, okay, we'll leave? You see, the positioning that they've, it's, it all, it's all about positioning. The way we've positioned ourselves is that we're the big dog on the hill. Russia is bad. America is good. And Russia's been invading the Ukraine. Russia has goals of becoming a, a world power again, a superpower. They're spreading their empire. And remember, I told you guys on Monday that that is exactly the way they would frame it. This is what I had to say on Monday. What you are going to hear, and I haven't watched any news on this, they are going to tell you that we, it, it is a lack of American leadership that has led Russia and China to move into the space, and now they are going to be exerting control and influence over the environment when we are the ones who should be doing that. 
and they will try and tell you how bad this is going to be because it happened, although they will not provide any clear uh, roadmap as for how it's going to be bad or any specifics as to how this is going to be a bad thing. They'll just simply say, because we're not the ones messing with it, it's a bad thing. And that's exactly what happened. If you were listening, I had somebody post it to me because I don't listen to Rush uh, very often, but he said, I, I, you know what, you hit it right on the head, Jason, exactly what you said was going to happen. I was listening to Rush, and, and he, said, uh, you know, he said exactly what you said he was going to say. And so I went to his YouTube uh, or his Facebook page, and I pulled a quote. This is what Rush had to say. He said, we've abandoned our role as the moral leader of the world, defending, the liberty, uh, defending liberty and freedom in the world. We've abandoned it. We've left. We've gotten out of the world. Putin is moving in because he wants to reconstitute Russia and the Soviet Union. This is a power play. Well, most certainly it is. But let's not pretend like we were a, some moral authority in the world. <laughs> that we somehow were taking the moral high ground. It was absolutely a power play on our part as well. You see, the last thing that you should do, folks, is associate America and our, our belief, our core fundamental belief in liberty and free markets with the American government. Because they're two very different things. See, you can still love America and hate what our government is doing. You can still be passionate about the stars and bars and still have hope and cling to the idea that this is the land of the free and the home of the brave, that this is a place where we want to defend liberty, and still not be for us going overseas every time there's a tragedy and is seeking to exert our will on other countries and other regions. One of the first things that I realized when I went to war, and this is something that someone else brought up as well who'd been in the military, and, and a lot of military guys leave feeling the same way. He said, I bought into this notion that, that I wanted to defend liberty, that I believed in freedom, and I signed up to be in the military. And what I realized when we went to war is that wasn't what we were doing. That was the furthest thing from what we were doing. We talked about the Afghan boy who was being raped by the, police, the Afghan police officer. And you had two special operations guys who ended up beating the tar out of this guy. And it kicked him out of the military. Does that sound like somebody who's there for the right reasons, who's there spreading liberty and democracy? Does that sound like a country that really cares about spreading the ideas and values that we have? No. It wasn't what we were doing in Afghanistan. It wasn't what we were doing in Iraq. And guys, when I was there, I wasn't working for the military. It wasn't like I was confined to just military operations. I was working right alongside the State Department. I sat in the meetings on the construction projects. I drove out to see the roads that we were spending hundreds of millions of dollars to be built that weren't being built. The massive wealth transfer from U.S. taxpayers to Iraqi government officials. The corruption was sickening. You cannot confuse the core principles that we built America on with the government actions that are being taken. It's very important. And so when we look across the pond and we look at what's happening in the Middle East and we look at Russia coming in and bringing their war planes in, what I would say if I was in charge was, thank goodness, this is your mess now. And that's the way I'd present it to the American people. I would say this is ridiculous. It's been nothing but a, a, a quagmire since we got into it, and we're done. Let them mess with it. We're going to focus on fixing our economy, which is in dire straits. But I want to bring this home, or bring home uh, some of the ideas that we have been talking about over the last few days. And as I said yesterday, I tried to paint a broad picture for you about what was happening around the world and the new alliances that were being formed and, and how it might affect global markets and the prospects for peace. 
On Monday, we talked about the media, how it would likely frame the current power shift in the Middle East, and as usual, I was spot on. The Federal Reserve, along with other central banks around the world, are caught in this quagmire of low interest rates, low inflation, no growth. This presents a huge risk to the economy. Carl Icahn recently posted a video to his website outlining the huge risks in the U.S. economy brought on by the search for higher returns and mythical profits. More specifically, he explained better than anyone how the high yield and junk bond markets have grown out of control brought on by that need for higher returns due to low interest rates and no growth. Now, I'm not going to detail for you uh, what the junk bond market is, but I will link to his video on the show page, which you can go to at jasonstapleton.com. So if you want to know a little bit more about what Carl Icahn had to say about it, I thought he discussed it brilliantly. I've talked about the dangers of the bond market, but I've, I've, uh, I have uh, kind of focused my discussion about the risk of the bond market to the government bond market. What Carl Icahn discusses is that there is a $2 trillion junk bond market that's going to collapse. And he would know something about that because he spent the last 40 years doing exactly that. He understands the business bond market better than anybody in the world. So I invite you to go to jasonstapleton.com under the podcast header later on today and watch the video that he put together. Well, that's all big picture stuff, right? How does all of this debt and slow growth and this progressive Keynesian policy affect your life? I think the answer can be found in an article posted this morning in Investor's Business Daily. And it reads as follows. Jim Artis may may well have one of the hardest jobs in America. He's 55, and he's been mayor of Peoria, Illinois, for 10 years. His budget is smaller than it was when they managed it 10 years ago, yet the share devoted to public pensions has spiked from 9% to 24% even with workforce cutbacks. Public officials around the country are in the same boat, but Artis has another problem. Peoria is the world headquarters for the global behemoth Caterpillar. And though Peoria's economy has diversified, the equipment maker is still by far the city's biggest employer. Caterpillar announced on today that it would lay off 15,000 workers over the next three years in order to cut costs by billions. Caterpillar's announcement has little to do with the slow-moving shift in the American economy. You see, mining giants like Freeport McRand and, uh, and Rio Tito Group have slashed capital spending on demand and prices for, as prices for iron, copper, and coal have tumbled. That's slamming companies like Caterpillar who provide their equipment. So let me bring this big picture and then draw it home. You see, we talk about the global economy. And I've talked with you before about the numbers coming out of China and how China is claiming that they have 7, 8, 10% growth, yet the economy isn't reflecting that. Huge slowdown in, in China, the world's second biggest economy. And we don't know what China's growth rate is, but it's not 7%. Some say it's as low as 2%. And for years, China drove the international demand for things like iron, copper, coal, steel, all of this stuff, because they were building, 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 building all the time. Now their economy is moving into recession as well. And the demand for those things, those hard assets, those raw materials, the iron ore, the copper, is drying up as well. Australia had largely weathered the storm of the major recession that had hit the rest of the world because they were a major exporter of these types of things. Now their economy is starting to turn down. Meanwhile, mining companies that were mining for things like copper and ore, well, their business has slowed because China has reduced its spending and its acquisition of those commodities. Guess who buys their equipment to mine those things from Caterpillar? Well, those companies do. So China begins to purchase less, 
The ore manufacturers have reduced spending and reduced output. They're purchasing less equipment. Caterpillar is selling less equipment. Caterpillar has to lay off 15,000 people. You guys tracking? From international markets to somebody's kitchen table. That's how it moves. The commodities bust is playing out in China. The locomotive of the world's economy is coming uh, in for a hard landing. No one has any idea how fast the world's number two economy is actually growing, but is certainly not hitting the government's 7% target. Its economy is still swing, uh, swinging from being manufacturing dominated to one focused on services. Artist doesn't yet know how many jobs will be lost in the upcoming cuts. Media reports have suggested that Caterpillar will lay off thousands of people across Illinois over the next year, much of them likely coming to Peoria. On Thursday, Caterpillar CEO Douglas uh, Obenhallman wrote a letter to Peoria community, noting that sales, this is important, noting that sales and revenues have fallen every year since 2012. He said, quote, it's very likely that 2016 will be our fourth consecutive year of lower sales and revenue. That's never happened in the 90-year history of our company. Think about that. A company that has been around for nearly 100 years is now set to have its fourth declining year in a row. Yet this economy is supposed to be on the mend. We're supposed to be turning up. If you listen to Obama, the worst is over. He saved us. The Fed is talking about raising interest rates. Well, we debunked that yesterday, didn't we, with the help of Mark Jones from the private Facebook group. It ain't getting better. It's getting a whole lot worse. But we've got bigger problems. You see, we got to bring this from Main Street or from, uh, from international markets down to your home plate. You see Peoria's challenge? Paying off legacy costs with revenue from what might be called legacy economies. You see, when the industry was booming, when things were going great and everybody was making money hand over fist, the people inside of government got a little bit greedy. The unions decided that they, they wanted pay raises with all this extra money coming in. And, and we want to build a lot of new facilities and finance that with future debt. And you know what? We want more pension programs. We want a better pension health care plan. We want better retirement. And they fought for those things. And because everything was going good, the government gave them what they wanted. But you see, as anyone who's lived in an economy or run a business long enough understands, is that good times often follow bad times. And the good times don't ever last forever, despite what we might believe. And so now that we've come into a downturn, Peoria is in the awkward situation of not having enough money to pay its bills. Because you see, it's made a lot of promises to future payments to retirees who no longer work but who are still being paid as though they are working. Artists speak sincerely about wanting to honor commitments to the city's retirees but uh, despairing, uh, despairingly about the strapped budget resources. Making a dent in the pension morass, Peoria's plans are only about 58 percent funded, is like, quote, bailing out your swimming pool with a thimble. Times were good. People made a lot of requests, made a lot of demands. They said, hey, things are going swimmingly. We deserve a little bit bigger piece of the pie. We want a little bit bigger guarantee for the future. And the, the governments gave it to them. This is the same thing that happened to GM, by the way. Detroit is largely bankrupt. But during the good years when GM and Chrysler were doing well and they were all making money hand over fist, the unions came in and they started demanding more and more and more. They said, you owe, because it's our labor that created all of this. It's us down there on the factory line who are making things happen. And you guys are making all this money up here. You owe us. Now, it's not all that simple, but that's the gist of it. Nobody ever plans or the rough times. When things are going well, we assume that they're always going to go well. 
but you need to be preparing for the future. One of the things that I have always talked about on this show is investing in your own human capital. You've got a lot of factory line workers who've been doing it for 20 years who never took the time to invest in their own human capital. And then what happens? Well, the unions came in and they demanded $30 an hour. When Mexican labor, by building a factory down there, they'd be able to work for $2 an hour. So what happens? The factory moves. At some point, there's a break. And the company says it's not financially beneficial for us to remain. In government, it works the same way. You've got government leaders, mayors, and and city council members and and legislatures who are saying, you know what? We want to honor our commitments, but we can't. We've got a, in this case, a uh, $82 million budget and $20 million of it is going to pensions. Retired health care costs are eating up $10 million a year of the budget. We can't do it. But that didn't keep the retirees, the people who were made pro- who, were, who promises were made to from saying, you owe. But something's going to have to change. The way that you protect yourself, because there is very little that you can do if you live in Peoria, Illinois, and your, and your government has managed to put you into a position where they can no longer pay their debt, and now they're going to have to make cuts or go into bankruptcy or, or cut funding for roads or bridges or whatever the case may be. You cannot fix those problems now. He finishes off this article by saying something that we have talked about repeatedly. He said there are no easy answers. They all involve pain. What have we been saying on this show? Every single day, you should be finding a way to invest in your own human capital. What knowledge or skill are you using that is valued by someone else? I don't care whether it's another employer or whether it's someone that you're going to sell directly to. You had better be investing in that because the economy and the world that we are facing in the 21st century is not going to value your four-year college degree. It won't be enough. You had better be learning every single day, no matter what your job is, no matter where you are at. If you think your job is secure now, think again. I agree with Mark. I think we have a collapse coming that is bigger than anything any of us in our lifetime have seen. I think it is going to be worse than 08. And the people who are going to survive that are going to be the people whose human capital makes them valuable makes them indispensable in a company. They may say, we can fire everybody else, but we can't fire Susie. Because we can't do this job without Susie. If Susie goes, the company goes. That's how valuable you need to be. So start working on it every day, because I. that's how we get from China, international markets, wars in Syria, people aligning themselves, teams being chosen up down to your table at home and the decisions you need to be making to improve your life and your own condition. Guys, if you like this show, download and subscribe. Make sure you subscribe so you get the show every day. Spend an hour with me. As I said before, you're going to be more informed, better prepared, and more confident to talk about liberty with your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, your coworkers, than anybody else that you know. And then please, if you love this show, share it with someone else. The growth that we see in this show is one, almost 100% due to you guys sharing and spreading the message. I can't do it without you. We can't begin to affect change alone as independent people. We have to come together and we have to motivate each other. And one of the easiest ways for you to spread the message of liberty is just to tell them about this show. Let me do the talking. If you don't yet have the confidence, let me do it. You just make the introduction. And if you'll do that, I'll be back here tomorrow to do this all over again. Until then, be safe, be good. I'll talk to you then.